This was the first British foothold in Southeast Asia, Penang, Penang Island, uh, where I'm standing, leased to the British East India Company in the 1780s by the Sultan of Kedah. Now the Sultan of Kedah, he had strategic reasons for doing so. He hoped that a military alliance with the British and that that British presence would act as a deterrent to his own enemies, to his enemies from the north, Siam and Burma. So he made it part of the agreement that the British would provide military protection for him. Now, unfortunately for him, the guy involved in the negotiations didn't really have the authority to make such a promise, but that'll work itself out later. The British spoke of this place, for their part, as a trading post, but they had strategic reasons of their own. So you have the French poking around in Indochina to the north. You've got the Dutch, of course, in the south. And so the British have their reasons for sort of, you know, marking their own territory and creating their own sort of stumbling block to French expansion and Dutch expansion to the north and to the south. So the British built this fort. Well, they built a fort in this site uh, made of, it was made of logs. This is a brick fort that will be built later. Well, this one is over 200 years old. Anyway, the British marked their spot with a fort. They worked out the lease and thus had gained their first, their initial foothold here in this region of the world. Well, it turned out for the Sultan that leasing this island to the British was a bad move. Not only did the British renege on their promise to provide military assistance, they decided they weren't interested in that sort of thing, uh, particularly Lord Cornwallis, whose name this fort bears. But uh, when he tried to take the island back, he couldn't do it. Eventually, he and the British were able to work something else out. Basically, they paid him. They paid him off every year, paid him an honorarium. And that was that. The island was theirs. So it did, things didn't work out too well for the Sultan of Kedah. But for the British, things worked out really well. Not only did they get the island, but they were able to create a fantastically successful trade depot here in Penang, or here on uh, you know, Prince of Wales Island, as they called it. And the way they did it was by creating a free trade zone. They, they made it a free port, a free economic zone. Merchants didn't have to pay taxes and duties if they came through here, like they would have to in you know, Dutch ports or whatnot. And so within just a few years, this place went from having almost no ships pass through it, obviously, to having thousands of ships stop here and trade here and do business here in Penang. So it was a very, very successful free trade experiment. Uh, in fact, Penang would remain a free trade zone, a free port, all the way up till 1969. We're talking from the 1780s all the way to 1969, when the Malaysian government finally stripped it of its free, uh, you know, free port status, unfortunately. Now, of course, British control is not going to end at the shores of Prince of Wales Island. It's going to expand. Well, how does it do this? Well, here we come to a pattern in colonial history, a pattern revolving around the need for buffer, buffer territory. I see basically what happens, and this is, by the way, how you build an accidental empire, as the British Empire is often called. First step, obtain a port. Of course, the British have obtained a port. They've built a port here at Penang. Second step, you have to secure the port. And often, securing the port means gaining buffer territory. And so in the case of Penang, there's a strip of coastline across from the island that was deemed necessary for the security of Penang. And so it must be obtained. And so the Sultan's honorarium is bumped up, and that strip of land is obtained by the British. But then what happens often in colonial history is then that original buffer, which brings the colonial power up against new people and new circumstances, now you've got to secure that strip of land, that area. And so you create another buffer, and so on and so forth. And this is how you expand. Okay, so eventually we know the British are going to control most of this peninsula. But it starts with Penang, the port, and then the coastal strip of buffer, and it goes from there. You'll see the same pattern in India. The British now have a foothold on the mainland. Meanwhile, events in Europe have set that continent on fire. I'm talking about the French Revolution and the subsequent Napoleonic Wars. Lots of death, chaos, and destruction over in Europe and, you know, rippling out across the world. The British, though, are able to take advantage of it in Southeast Asia and emerge from this conflict as in a much stronger position than they were before, uh, partly by taking over Dutch holdings during the course of the wars, uh, ostensibly in order to 
prevent the French from taking them over. Even though they do end up giving those back to the Dutch, they're in a much, much stronger position afterwards. In fact, by 1826, the British control Malacca, they control Singapore, and they control Penang. Penang being the capital, the headquarters of these Straits settlements. Now, if you think about British priorities in the 19th century and going into the 20th century, the British are number one on the seas, and they'd like to keep it that way. So if you look at a map, look where Malacca is, look where Singapore is, look where Penang is. These are very, very strategic holdings when it comes to the Straits, when it comes to that, that connecting uh, channel, connecting the South China Sea and the Pacific with the Indian Ocean and beyond. So very, very strategic holdings that the British have. We know too, though, that the British, it doesn't end at the ports, as we discussed. Uh, the British extend their influence and their power and their control across the Malay Peninsula and beyond. In fact, by World War I, they've created a patchwork of protectorates, essentially. They let local elites stay in place and create protectorates with residents over these people. And by the outbreak of World War I, they've They've got a whole patchwork of protectorates extending all the way across the peninsula and beyond. And over it all is the British. And this is really important because there is no history of one big unified state in what is today Malaysia. It was always many different states. And for many societies here, particularly up in the hills, no states. These are stateless societies in some cases. And here come the British creating this massive, what is, is historically, for this area, this massive patchwork under one authority at the end of the day. Now, the British presence on the Malay Peninsula had a significant demographic impact. See, there were Chinese and Indians living here before the British, but there was a huge influx of Chinese and Indian immigrants during the British period. The British actually encouraged the Chinese to come, to come to the port cities, Chinese entrepreneurs and business types, to come and do their, you know, ply their trade at the, in the port cities, and they came by the thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands. The Indians came as well, also as entrepreneurs, but also as laborers from British India and also as convicts. In fact, the wooden fort that I mentioned before, that today is a brick and stone fort, this fort right here, this was built by Indian convict labor in the 18 zeros over 200 years ago. Okay, so lots of Indian and Chinese immigrants here now, which will forever change the demographics of Malaysia or what will in the future be called Malaysia, and will have major social and even political effects running into the present. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. Well, the British temporarily lost possession of this place during World War II to the Japanese, after which, of course, they got it back for a while. But at that point, it was clear that independence was coming. The question was, what kind of independence? What would it look like? Again, no history of some big unified state like there is today. Uh, before this. So what would independence actually look like? And there were many in Malaysia, or what would become Malaysia, who weren't so keen on living in a Malay-dominated state. So for example, here I am in Penang. Here in Penang, uh, led by many of the Chinese and the Indians, many preferred secession from the future proposed you know, Federation of Malaya, or being joined to Singapore as part of a crown colony. I mean, these were preferable to many of these people than joining some mega Malay state. And it was even worse in Northern Borneo, in the north part of Borneo, where the vast majority of the population were not Malay. I mean, they, these are not Malay people. Complicating matters too, you've got other centralized governments, notably that of the Philippines and that of Indonesia, fighting over the same territory. So it's a little bit of a mess. Well, independence came in 1957, and six years later, the Federation of Malaya, which managed to drag Sarawak, North Borneo, and Singapore into it, became Malaysia, a polity for which there had been no precedent before British colonization. Okay? The only reason the northern part of Borneo was even part of this new entity, Malaysia, was because the British had controlled northern Borneo, northern part of Borneo, before independence. And really, the only reason there was a unified peninsular Malaysia was because the British had controlled most of it before independence. Okay? So if we're looking for legacies of the British Empire in Southeast Asia, one of the greatest has to be Malaysia itself, or the current borders of Malaysia. I mean, this is one of the great imprints of the old British Empire in Southeast Asia.